The Saban rule may be on the chopping block. Do you know what the Saban rule is? Well, let's just talk about it. So what is the Saban rule? In a word, pathetic. But to put a finer point on it, what the Saban rule is, is when head coaches cannot go out on the road in the spring and evaluate. Assistant coaches can, but head coaches can't. Now, it wasn't always that way. And you may ask, why did it change? Well, why is it pathetic even? Why did you call it pathetic? Here's what happened. Let me tell you a little story. So once upon a time, there was a guy, his name was Nick Saban. The aforementioned Saban rule has been unofficially named after him. He goes to LSU. He wins a title. The Miami Dolphins say, come coach for us. He goes down there. It doesn't necessarily work out. And so he goes back to Alabama. The year is 2007. And Nick Saban starts putting together really good recruiting classes. And so in the spring of 2008, they put a rule in to where he can't be out on the road. He was living on the road. I doubt half the time he even went home at night. He's in every high school. He's like, he's pulling a uh, Ron Meyer, just a barnstorming tour. He's all over the place. And so here's what really happened. What happened was it was, or it used to be, that once you got through spring, that was kind of an unofficial finish line. And head coaches hit it big chest and they break the tape. And so now once we got done with the spring game, we still got a lot of work to do. It's not like we're not going to come to the office, but we know we got SEC media days coming up in mid July. And right now it's late April. So I'm thinking May, June, we got some time to take some vacation. Good deal. And so you know, you carve out two weeks, three weeks, especially if you're an assistant, you're going to get some downtime, some family time. These things are not in and of themselves bad concepts. But then this cyborg walks in and he, he doesn't blink as he says any of this. He says, I don't, I've never heard of the word vacation, much less take any of them. I don't really sleep a whole lot. I have no interests outside of this sport. I just want to go and see high school kids all spring. And so the coaches who actually want some work-life balance and they wanted to be home, I don't know, a couple hours a week, they didn't like this. We can do this stuff in the fall, but in the spring and early summertime, man, we're supposed to have some downtime. And this guy's walked in at Alabama, and he's out there at every high school. In fact, he's more active in our state than we are in our own state this time of year. We can't have that. And so they complained, and they did it about Urban Meyer. They did it about Pete Carroll, but then finally Nick Saban was the tipping point, and they got aggravated that they were getting outworked in the spring. They, as far as I'll go, they is about as close as I'm going to get to naming names I think a lot of us know who we're talking about here, but uh, there were probably a lot more complainers that never really were highlighted, so that's why I'm not naming names. They complained enough to where the NCAA said, all right, get those head coaches off the road. These poor head coaches. I mean, some of these guys aren't even paid $5 million a year. We can't expect them to work 12 months a year. My goodness. And so we take them off the road. Nick Saban comes off the road. He's, one, two, three. He's only won six national championships since then. So it's become apparent, apparently, as of late, that it didn't really do anything to deter the Alabama recruiting machine. Enter Brian Fisher from Anthlon.com. He gets on Twitter the other day. And I didn't even have my contacts in when I first read the tweet. And so I put my contact in because I'm almost legally blind to make sure I was seeing what I thought I was seeing. Jesse, I think we actually have a screenshot of the tweet if you want to put it up. So Brian Fisher with Anthlon.com just takes to Twitter.com the other day and puts this up. He says, scoop. And boy, was it. As part of an NCAA recruiting review, there have been discussions about eliminating the Nick Saban rule, which prevents head coaches from going on the road during the spring eval period. Debate will continue at D1 Council next week. This is great. If we want to have a ceremonial burning of the actual Saban rule, I volunteer our desk right here. I, I'm not sure we're clear to do control burns around here, but to be honest, no one else has been in this building in months. So if you don't tell, I won't tell. Why is it dumb? Like, let's, let's shift it down to brass tacks here. Why is it dumb for head coaches not to be able to go out on the road in spring like I'm suggesting it is? I, I thought this rule was laughable when they put it in. In fact, I'm for loosening the rule more than it was written previously before the Saban rule. Like, what really was rubbing some head coaches the wrong way, aside from not being able to vacation as much as they wanted to, was Saban, they were accusing him at least, Saban was going out on the road, and he was doing more than just bumping into kids. They had the bump rule, where, you know, if, if you're Johnny Five Star, and I'm at Bastrop High School in Louisiana, and I'm there to see you, 
I can come watch you, but I cannot communicate with you. I can't sit there and have a conversation with you. I know if you're not a college football fan, this sounds like the stupidest thing you've ever heard. And it is. But these were the NCAA rules. So them's what we got to live with. But what you were allowed to do, if you bumped into him and say, hello, Johnny, I'll be back to recruit you in the fall. Say hi to your mother. That's what you were allowed to do. Well, there were some allegations out there, imagine this, that Nick Saban was doing a little bit more than just saying, hi, how are you? See you later. He was asking, how do you like the weather? And what'd you have for lunch? And so that's a no-no. We can't have that. I think that part's stupid. So I think it should be deregulated even more. But even if we just return to the way it was, why is this valuable? Well, I'll name you like 57 reasons I would, but I don't have time right now. Number one, it punishes hard work. So I'm against pretty much anything that does that. But then number two, it prevented valuable access. You want to know why the transfer portal so lit up? Well, one of many reasons is how about not giving head coaches proper evaluation time? What if I were to suggest to you that if head coaches could get out on the road more and talk to more guidance counselors, teachers, coaches, assistant coaches, and the like in the spring, that they could put a finer filter on their committable offer versus non-committable offer list. Therefore, you get more guys on your campus that you know are good fits. Therefore, maybe on the back end, you have a few less transfers per year. That's one of many reasons. But you know what it also does? Talk to high school coaches. Ask them what it does to their program, to the community, to continuously have Lincoln Riley coming through town or Herm Edwards or Clay Helton or Nick Saban or any of these head coaches, it's a really, really big deal. Because not only does that head coach coming into town get access to at least evaluating players that are going to be rising seniors, they also get their eyes on kids they weren't even there to see. And they get their eyes and they get their actual face-to-face -face with some assistant coaches that they've never met before. Dude, Jeremy Pruitt, a decade and a half ago, was not even a head coach at the high school level. He was an assistant at Hoover High School, ended up being one of the highest profile defensive coordinators and ultimately a head coach in the SEC. How do you think that stuff happens? And so here's yet another aspect. Also, and this is not talked about a whole lot, but I can promise you from firsthand knowledge it happens. A lot of these coaches, Nick Saban, a lot of these high profile coaches, they'll go out on the road having monstrous recruiting budgets and they'll see obviously hundreds of kids. You know, if I'm, let's say I'm Nick Saban and I go to uh, Spain Park High School and I'm looking at a rising junior or a rising senior who's going to be an offensive guard that I may want to offer, I see like 30 or 40 other kids out there that day. I'm not going to offer those kids. I, I'm Alabama. I only have spots for the very best in America. But I know the head coach at Texas San Antonio or um, I know the head coach at Temple or I, I got all kind of connections at the FBS, FCS level. Those guys have fractions of the recruiting budgets I do. Let me tell you what happens a lot of times. A lot of times, those big-time, high-profile head coaches, they leave those high school practices, and they say, there's one kid on that roster I could take. There are seven kids on that roster that are or should be D1 bound. And so they share information. That stuff happens every recruiting cycle, out of the spotlight, you don't see it. It can only happen if they're out there, guys. It can the evaluation can only take place if the eyeballs are there to see the players. And so this is a situation where football-minded people get it. But then a lot of bow tie types, you know, a lot of sweater vest types, the non-football types that unfortunately are putting the language in those rules, they don't get that. And so you got to get enough people in the room who get it to overtake the ascot crowd who doesn't always get it and therefore you get more common sense legislation or in this case deregulation and let's keep our fingers crossed because it's good for everyone hurts virtually no one and the people it does hurt the most are the ones who don't really want to work and therefore we don't really care about them anyway